Okay, good morning. It's time. <laughs> How are we doing? Um, so today we will kind of go over a brief overview of session 11 and 12 on beam bending. And then we will uh, essentially let folks work on this problem. But given that we have an exam tomorrow, I'll be happy to answer questions on, on what we'll be covering there. So just to kind of give an overview, so, uh, session 11 and 12, and actually, if we go to the, the syllabus quickly, the next few sessions are going to be covering beam bending. So we'll be getting into beam bending for one, two, three, four sessions. So today, one and two are combined. And the assignments associated with what we cover today, they will be due on Wednesday, so after the exam. The exam goes up to session 10? Right, so the exam it goes through session 10. Okay, so uh, torsion and twisting. All right, and we'll have, we'll have time to kind of go through and discuss uh, elements of, of session, sessions one through 10 uh, after we get through an introduction on, uh, on beams, okay? So if you, if you like, there are a few places you can look for uh, information on these two sessions. One is in the OneNote file that you can access from, from the website. And what, what we say is that we want to be able to think about <clears throat> how loads across a beam relate to internal bending, bending moments, internal shear forces, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the relationships between shear forces and distributed loads, and also the relationships between these shear forces and, and bending moments. Okay, and so here is a, a beam that has different loads, maybe internally, maybe externally acting on it. So we think of these axial forces as being along the beam. And we then think about these other forces like Fxz in this given coordinate system and Fxy as being transverse loads. So both of these, Fxz and Fxy, those would be transverse forces. They are lacking, la acting orthogonal to the direction along the beam. And then there can also be uh, transverse moments and typically in this case we're looking at moments like this xz all right that's kind of at the end of the beam but you could think of it as also being kind of uh with a typically what we see is we have uh, if we're doing like a 2d cut like we have here right so this would be uh these would be equivalent to these xz all right that we're we're drawing here okay so um, at least uh, the slightly different of, uh, how do you like, yeah, slightly different, but, um, but that, that's how I would look at this as like this moment, right? Is this moment right here, okay? And, uh, but you, you could also think of a moment that would be uh, in, this, in this direction. So bending about an axis, like about this y-axis here, okay? So uh, these are the kind of options that we have. We have axial forces, we have shear forces, we have bending moments, and then we have twisting moments. And we're not gonna think too much about twisting moments. And we're not gonna think too much about axial forces, especially since we've already talked about them. Same thing you could say about twisting moments too. All right. And then the supports for the beams, the typical ones that we'll find are, bin, are pinned, roller, and fixed as you see here. Right. And I've mentioned this before, but if you are looking at CDL's book, all right, Crandall, Don, Lardner, 
which I don't expect many of you would be because Hibbler is mostly what we're using here, you'd see that the conventions are actually uh, different when it comes to uh, drawing out the internal uh, forces, okay, for, for shear force, okay? Um, now, just uh, what, what you'll see if you go into the, the slides, okay, is you'll see that we do describe kind of a general approach to these problems, and this is from CDL, okay, so again, I don't think you'd probably be looking at this book, but uh, if you do, this is what you would find. They suggest three different steps. So creating a model, which is essentially make a free body diagram. Then look at external equilibrium. Okay, uh, So this is similar to what we would be doing first when we do statics. Typically, right, we first do external equilibrium, and then we get into the internal equilibrium. And so that third step, using sections to handle the internal equilibrium. Right? So those three steps. Sometimes you might want to make a column or three different columns. Um, it's, it's up to you. And you are familiar with how to, to draw those, okay? But this slide may contain some new information for you, okay, that you may not have covered in statics. So we've talked about shear forces, we talked about bending moments, but we can also relate the bending moments to the shear forces, and then we can do something kind of interesting, and that is relate the shear force or the change in the shear force, the derivative of the shear force with respect to the axial direction to an applied distributive force. Okay, so what this is this is kind of giving you the the these are the big equations that you would want to have on your uh, note sheet for exam two. Okay. But then we go into how these are derived, okay? And there are some things to keep in mind, and as you watch the video, I think I emphasize this pretty well, that there are conventions, or there is another convention that we introduce for uh, distributed load, okay? And this can be different for different texts, different people, okay? But what we're gonna say is that an upward distributed force, so this is W, and W would have uh, units of, of uh, newtons per meter, okay? So as we're going across here, this distributed force, okay, is, if it's in the upper direction, it's positive. And then what we, we remember are the conventions that we have for shear force and bending moment. So if you take a slice and you're opening to the left, okay, then the shear force is up. If you take a slice and you're opening to the right, then the shear force is down. And in both cases, you have happy smiley faces, okay, causing this thing to, to bend and kind of smile. Now, these are the derivations. You can go through these as you watch the notes, okay? Nonetheless, you'll, you'll find that you will probably come back to these and be like, why, why? Why is it this way? Okay. And if you were stuck, I wouldn't expect you to do this on exam, but if you were stuck at any point, you could redo these derivations as long as you keep in mind what the appropriate conventions are okay, for our, 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 our course and for Hibbler's book. One thing that might be a little bit new is to think of uh, taking a slice where you expose both sides across the beam. Normally, right, we take a slice and we we, we cover up, as Jeff Hansen says, you cover up one side and then you look at what's going on on the side of interest, all right? Or you cover up this side and you look at what's going on on this side of interest. In this case, when we do these derivations, we're actually taking and exposing both sides and then looking at what's happening inside in the middle, okay? And what might be interesting is that this very short infinitesimally narrow element along the beam is having some length delta x and then we can say 
also that there's a very small change in the shear force as we go from this side to this side. And there's a very small change in the bending moment as we go from this side to this side. Okay, so that's what we see with this m plus delta m and this v plus delta v. Now, one thing also to note, if there were no change, if there, if you know you had a situation where the shear force were constant across this particular region, well, delta v would be equal to zero. Or if the bending moment is constant across this particular section, right, delta m would be equal to zero. And as we've discussed previously, but maybe not highlighted as carefully as it is here, the convention, right, v and this v, uh, and now not plus delta v because we'll say that this delta v is equal to zero, these two are equal to each other. And they are acting in opposite directions, right? So depending on which side of the slice we're exposing, okay, that's the direction that these v's would go, and they are equal to each other. Right, so this shear force that if I calculate on this side, this shear force would be describing the same shear force okay, that's, that's on the other side. So that's in full display here. All right? And again, the distributed force is positive going upward here. Okay, um, there are, uh, so this slide essentially gets the derivations of these two big formulas that we'll be using in the future or in this assignment. Um, and uh, then what I do is I go through some examples in the, in the videos and in the notes. So take some time looking at distributed force, looking at what the shear force and what the bending moment look like across that beam. How do we graph these? Okay, and keeping in mind the convention that we have. So the convention also transfers over to these bending moment graphs. Okay, and so what you'll what you'll see all right and is that we defined a positive v right uh, as above the axis and this would be a minus m all right or minus v would be below a minus m would be below as well okay and we think of these uh, as values that can change along the beam as we go along okay so um one thing, uh, there, there are actually two that are often a little bit confusing, and we haven't really focused on these much here, but I'm sure you saw them in statics, is what happens if you have a concentrated force acting along the beam? Okay? Or what happens if you have a concentrated moment acting along the beam? And there are conventions. Normally we say, hey, do whatever you want for the external loads, but there are conventions here to keep in mind. Okay, and the um, convention is that if the force being applied is vertically upward as you're going along that beam, so you know whatever your internal internal shear force is, is and then and then you run into that uh, concentrated force acting upward, that causes a jump. All right, so if I were, you know, if I had a graph that was showing my shear force as I move along and then I get to this concentrated load you'd see a jump by that concentrated force okay on this diagram and then it could continue along that new jump okay so this is that delta v is equal to f if f were going downward well then it would be a jump downward okay it'd go negative and this one is counterintuitive, all right? And people ask about this one all the time. They say, well, okay, I'm applying a moment. And if you look about that, if you think about the right-hand rule, that's an applied moment going in to the board, okay? Into the piece of paper. And we normally think of that as being a negative, all right? But given our convention, that actually results in a positive internal moment. Okay, a positive jump in internal moment. And again, there will be time for you to, to look at this in the assignments. For, so the, the first, like beam, this is session 11, the first two questions are just multiple choice, but beams uh, two or session 12 gets much more involved. All right, and you'll see that here. And 
In this session, we're going to use these same expressions, okay? but we're going to introduce a new way of doing these graphs. So kind of in session 11, it's like, okay, I remember how I do uh, the, the graphs, uh, and now what we're going to introduce is using um, essentially uh, an integral method, okay? So the methodology, okay, uh, that we've, we've, we've used in the past has been, okay, do equilibrium, do equilibrium, take keeping slices, do equilibrium across the beam. But now what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, I've got these two equations, dv dx is equal to w, the distributed force, and dm dx is equal to v. So how do we uh, potentially use this information to create these plots, but not having to continually uh, think about the slice and thinking about equilibrium, okay? Now, the first step is still to do equilibrium, and we're still using equilibrium, all right? So you're, we're still, we still had to do the external loading first, okay? But what you do is you take a look at the internal moment and the internal shear force at the extremes, okay? Or at the ends of the beam. And then from there, once you've calculated what those internal shear force and bending moments might be, you can go ahead and you can use these equations and do integration, okay, to be able. So imagine, what am I saying here? For example, if you, uh, if you have Okay, some internal shear force at the end. Let's just call it one newton, whatever it is. What it says is that the integral, so this gets rearranged. Okay, this gets rearranged so that we have integral of dv is equal to integral w dx. Okay, like that. Right? Just move, just move this at dx over here and then integrate both sides. So when we, when we move things over, what we see is that, oh, uh, this like, this, this V, right, is gonna be integral to equal to this, okay, like that. And there can be a constant, okay, because these are indefinite integrals in this form. Okay. So you have this ability now to say, okay, how does V change as we move along the beam? And we have an initial condition, right? We know what it was at a left side or a right side or where we're starting, and that could influence the C that we have, the indefinite part. Now, if there's no distributed force, right? We're talking about distributed forces. If there is no distributed force on the beam, well, that means that this is integral of zero dx, which is a zero, so this stays constant. So V actually stays constant, okay? And if you do equilibrium, you'll see the same thing. Now, similarly, once we've calculated out what V is, what the profile of the internal shear force is along the beam, we can also take this expression and do the integral of dm dx, okay? Well, actually, sorry. We do the integral of dm, is equal to the integral of v dx, and we'll call that plus c2. When we do this integral, we get m equals sum integrate what v is, okay, plus the c2. And if there were some internal shear force at the end, say one newton meter internally, right, that would be a good indicator of what c2 would be. So c2 ends, is, ends up equal one. Newton meter, and then we're off, and we're looking at, okay, I have to integrate V dx. So V is a horizontal line. We integrate it, and that's going to be a parabola. If, uh, uh, if or uh, I'm sorry, that was, what did I just say? If v, is a, if v is a horizontal line, and I integrate it, it's going to be a, a line, 
right? It's going to have some slope now, okay? Uh, if V is a linear line and I integrate it, then it's going to be a parabola. So there will be opportunities for you to look at these relationships in more detail in, in, the, uh, in the sessions. So uh, these are some examples that we do. Uh, and, and so, for example, one thing to look at here is um, this is V as a function of X going across. And look, that's a line. That's a linear line that has first order behavior. Okay? Something, a constant, a negative constant times X because it's going down, right? It has a negative slope. Look at what you get here. If I integrate this V, right, I'm taking, I'm reorganizing this equation. I integrate it, what do I get? I get a parabola, like we said, becomes second order. And actually, uh, one other point, if, so that's the easier one that we're more familiar with. Well, maybe it's not easier, but it, we're familiar with it. The other thing is, look, remember this distributed force that by our convention is in the minus direction, so it's really like a minus w naught. That means, okay, if I integrate a horizontal line, that becomes, or just a, a flat line, right, that becomes a line with some slope, okay? This is a constant, a constant negative. We integrate it, so now we have, look, we have the linear slope here. Okay, again, so watch the video, and you'll be able to go through this, and there will be some problems and that you get to solve. And again, there will be some treatment of how we manage the discontinuities in, in force and moment. And that will pretty much get us through this, uh, this, this session. Okay. All right, so that is, uh, that is what we want to cover here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the exam for tomorrow. Okay. The exam, I, I sent out a note, right? And so logistically, you can bring in one sheet of handwritten notes. Must be handwritten, okay? So please do not. Uh, you can put anything you want on this sheet of notes, right? You can put example problems, whatever it is, just it has to be something that you've written, okay? You can, I mean, so you can take down notes from problems that we've done in the class, Comments from the internet, whatever you like, okay? Um, whatever you think will help you. Uh, and if you want to prepare it digitally, that's fine too, okay? You can print it up. Just don't make it microscopic. You're going to hand it in with your exam, okay? So uh, I, I strongly encourage you to put together something, right? Now, if you look at the session nine, okay, you'll see that uh, these are notes, and this is back from the spring, okay? Uh, I wrote out a number of equations that you might want to keep in mind for normal axial loading, okay? And if you think about what's going to happen tomorrow, you're going to be finding that pretty much problem is going to be broken down into either a, uh, a normal loading problem or a torsion problem, okay? That's, that's pretty much... How these these are broken down, right? And and so you know if we look at um, you know previous exams, with last semester being the most recent, uh, you will see that there were um, a pro there was a problem, okay, on essentially calculating out elastic modulus, right? Which we know is a normal loading problem. Okay, that's for an axial bar. These are material properties that we often calculate from axial loading. Okay. And then there was uh, an axial loading problem, okay. and that involved looking at this system as uh, spring with, in terms of bars as springs. Okay. So again, that's axial loading. And then there was a torsion problem. Okay. So there were those were the three. Uh, The, we couldn't cover everything. So, for example, that exam didn't have a thermal problem, okay? There was not a thermal problem, but that is, that is of course, fair game. 
uh, it didn't have an indeterminate torsion problem, okay, which are some of the harder ones. Okay, so um, th that uh, I think it was it was it had sufficient it had sufficient depth. Okay, and then if you want, you can you know here are some techniques that we've discussed for external equilibrium. Uh, first, and then internal equilibrium. Oh yeah, it also didn't have trusses. That was another thing that it didn't have. It didn't have a truss problem. Um, then, if if you want to take a look at uh, at uh, what happens in torsion, there are kind of only a there, I mean, there are only a few equations really. Uh, the big three would be. Um, this one, tau is equal to g gamma, okay? The shear modulus times the shear strain is equal to tau, okay? The shear stress or the shear strength, depending on the, the situation, okay? Uh, but that's uh, that's like at the limit, right, of the, the elastic regime for, uh, if it's shear strain, right? That's at the limit. Um, then we have uh, equations for the, this one, I mean, this one is, yeah, I mean, it's, this one's not the most popular one, okay, right, but yes, it's important, gamma is equal to, this is not what I would consider one of the big three, all right, uh, but uh, yes, gamma is equal to rho d phi dz, okay, um, and then uh, this, okay, is pretty important, important, that tau is equal to T rho over J, or tau max is equal to TC over J. So as we are in New Jersey, right, the way I remember this one is that tau is equal to TC and J. All right, so TC over J. So this is a big deal. And then we have uh, the equation, the, the third of the big three would be given for angle of twist, and that is phi is equal to TL over JG, okay? And notice there are some parallels to what we've seen, right? There's the formula that we have for axial loading, where we have PL over EA, okay, is equal to the displacement. Um, so phi is equal to TL over JG is a big one. And so those are the big three, but you still would be expected to know some of these other ones. Like for example, if you have a distributed torque, right, being applied to the system, then it will be necessary to use something like phi is equal to uh, the integral of TDZ over JG, right? And we went over this at the end of our last session. So if you wanna go back and, and see what we discussed the last time we met in uh, session, at the end of session 10, so, in particular for the distributed loading, we said there is kind of a more careful technique for handling this. Okay. And that was this. Okay, so yes, this equation, so if you have a distributed load, all right, so this has units, units of essentially newtons, but newton meters per meter, okay? And you have this distributed force, or distributed torque, sorry, along it, okay? Yes, the resulting phi is equal to TL squared over 2JG, but I was looking at it, and I think it's important to, to be a little more careful here. And this equation, this integral of T over J, J, G, all right, which has been written a few times. Just like we said, remember that the integral for, for an axial displacement, we said the integral of P over EA, right, DX, right, that P is an internal force. Same thing applies here. When we're looking at the angle of twist, okay, we are using an internal torque. Yes. Question, oh, Michael. I was just wondering if you go over Q4 from session nine. Okay, Q, all right, so, okay, hold on, all right. Um, all right, so, um, 
Okay, just so give us a second. All right. So as we're um, uh, looking to solve some of these problems, if it happens to be an indeterminate problem, that is when you have two techniques. Okay, one is superposition. So these techniques are not dissimilar from what we discussed when we were doing axial loading. You have the ability to look at doing superposition, having that load applied, then removing it, or, uh, or having that load applied, right, and then remove, or having that, sorry, having that constraint applied, removing that constraint, and then applying a load, okay, to get us back to zero displacement, or we can just use, or we can not just, it's complicated, but use geometric compatibility, okay, where we say, oh, okay, well, this, this displacement plus this displacement has to equal zero, and I go about trying to figure out what those displacements are. Remember, an indeterminate problem cannot be solved by just using equilibrium. What you'll find is when you put out the equations of equilibrium, that you have one or more unknowns than you have equations. Okay? And when that happens, that is when you need to take into account compatibility. So that is when you say, okay, last, I have to use my TL over JG okay, is equal to some angular displacement phi. Okay? Because there's no way for me to figure that out. No way to. Yeah, I need another equation. I have. I don't have enough equations for the, a number of nones. Another way to look at it is, okay, if I were to remove a constraint, okay, can I then solve this by equilibrium? And if that's the case, then you know that you also have a statically indeterminate problem. And in torsion, pretty much the the alarms go off, and my heart rate would go up as if I saw a problem where. I've got constraints on both ends, right? Because I'm like, last, I gotta do an indeterminate problem. Um, all right, so that's that's pretty much it for um, you know an overview. There are a number of equations for normal loading. Uh, I guess in this equation, did I? I mean, I think I put in the material properties. Uh, oh crud! I don't want that to load. Ah. Uh, Sorry about that. That's what happens if you do the wrong thing. Um, yeah, session nine. Did I put in the material properties? Yeah, there are, there are some material properties in here. Um, we have bulk modulus. We have, um, we have, yeah, we have sigma equals E epsilon for axial loading and for Hooke's law. So yeah, we. I think this is, you know, Maybe not everything, right? There's you still need to be able to do statics. Still need to be do able to you know. Uh, we still need to be able to relate um, forces to external loading and <coughs> be able to do method of sections and, and calculate what's happening internally. Okay. General questions before we try to look at what Michael was asking on a specific one. General questions. Where yes. Are you supposed to know the website. Okay, so if you go to hopefully most, if not all, the pages that we've gone through so far. So, for example, if we go to torsion one, what you should find, if I did it right, okay, is that you have the slides. All right, this is a PDF, and then this is the in class and office hour notes. Okay, so these are, so most everything that I've written, okay, is uh, recorded okay. somehow, right? So if you click on that link, then it opens up OneNote, and then if you click on session nine, it should come up, or right here. I think this is where it was. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, so yeah, because we have, sometimes we have some scribble scrabble, that's not, I mean, we have some, some uh, kind of notebook-based notes here, and we also have the, um, the slides. Okay, so now which question um, <coughs> uh, were you looking at? Uh, you said question, was session, Michael, was it that you wanted to review? Um, session nine, question four. 
Session nine, question four. Okay, this one right here. Oh, yeah. I was also wondering yeah. about that one. Okay. All right. So it's asking for the the shear. I'm asking for the shear stress. Okay, between B and C, but halfway between the center line and the outer surface. Okay. So the first question, the first thing we had to figure out is, well, what, how did you approach it? What is the first thing you would do here? I tried just using half of the diameter instead of the full diameter, but I'll do it. Well, no, 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 but before, so let's talk about the process, all right? So how do we figure out, so we're in between B and C. Oh, uh, you need the internal torque. Between right, right, we need to figure out what the internal torque is, right? Okay, so that, that's, uh, that's, that's, that makes sense, right? So let's go over here. So if I take a, a little slice here, right? I, I know I've got this 2t over 3 acting there, right? And so uh, if, if I were to use a convention, which is okay, right, where I say this is the positive, I'm going to say, well, I have this then acting this direction to follow the right hand rule so that internally if i have my internal torque right then um uh, what, what are we going to say here well it, it looks like i have a, a ti right yeah that's fine uh, we have a, a ti and then it's going to be minus 2t over 3 is equal to 0. So the ti is just 2t over 3. So we agree on that part, right? Okay. So uh, then, all right, we're saying, all right, it's uh, halfway between the center line and the outer surface, okay, um, bet between these two, okay. So... Uh, the equation, and we're looking for shear stress, right? So it's going to be okay, like that. Okay, so uh, like you were saying, uh, it should just be the c over two, right? So it should be uh, t c over 2j, okay? And we need to be careful with the units, right? Because we have uh, c, right, is equal to uh, 0 0.014 meters, okay? And we should also be careful with the j, right? But that's, so j, okay, is the polar moment of inertia. And the way, I, I always get confused here because I have either my pi over two Okay, uh, or my pi over four. Okay, for um, for these uh, for these uh, either you're either going to be doing I's or J's. Okay, and we'll, I guess we'll get into that later. But J for this problem is going to be pi over two. And the really the way I remember that. So what am I? I'm sorry. I guess I'm not being clear. But we're you're going in the later. We're going to have something called I. Okay, which is the second moment of area. Okay, and second moment of the area actually is pi over 4, okay, c to the 4th, and j is pi over 2 times c to the 4th for a circular cross-section. Okay, I don't, don't get yourself, probably don't want to get yourself confused, but I think i comes before j alphabetically, so the j is going to be bigger. Okay, that's how I remember it, okay? So in this case, all right, we, we still use the same j all right so this one the c is the 0.014 all right so this is going to end up being whatever this is 
That's, I think, where the confusion is coming in, is C is the outer diameter for the geometry. Okay? So it's always going to be whatever the outer geometry is. Okay? If I'm inside, rho is an internal radius. Okay? If, if you recall, when we did this, uh, let's see, where is the derivation? It may be in the previous set of slides. Okay, here it is. Okay. Okay. What we said is that for, for, for starters, we said, well, well, actually, first we derived that gamma is equal to rho d phi d, d z. And what we said is, okay, that, that is true. And then we're going to say that it varies linearly. The shear strain and the shear stress, they both vary linearly as a function of our distance from the middle. So at the middle, you see... What is it? It's zero for shear stress. It's zero for shear strain as well. Okay. And as we get to the outskirts of the, the rod or the shaft, okay, that's where the shear stress and the shear strain are going to be maximums or maximum. Okay. So as we, as we move, as we get our row, as we increase, that means that these increase Okay, or this increases, so for example, as rho increases, then gamma increases linearly. And gamma times g is equal to the shear stress. Okay. So then when you do this derivation where we connect, we integrate these shear stresses times the distance they're acting, right? So if you have a force, right, and you know how far it's acting from the from a center point, right, about which it's applying a torque, then we can figure out what that, what that torque is. Similarly, if we took the integral of rho, or I'm sorry, integral of tau dA, so we have all like these little points, or all these little areas, and we have shear stresses acting on them, and we integrate them over a given area, that will give us the, that will give us the, um, the, the, the torque, or that will give us, sorry, that will give us a force, okay, and then we have it times a row, and that gives us a torque. Okay, so yes, what needs to happen here is that we need to keep, even though it's internal, we don't change the geometry. Okay, we don't. This is the max value, right? But this J is for the entire cross section. That's for the entire geometry. Yes. I understand that C is a pixel geometry, yep. but it's equal to the radius. Isn't it? Of the G, oh, yes, of the G, and then yes, I agree with you on that. Okay, I mean, yeah. we just had it as a diameter when we were solving the problem for here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Good. Yes. Thank you very much. So this is actually, okay, yeah, it is diameter. Thank you very much. So this is divided by two. It's not the first time, it's the second time I think I've made that. So. I was solving with the diameter, and I was like, what am I doing wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That will do it. That will do it. So this is also going to be like that. Good. Good. All right. Other questions? Can we go over, like, like the distributed load, like, force, and, like, like, how do you know what that's equal to? Like, okay, so we're talking for normal loading now, or distributed force or distributed torque? It's session seven. I Okay, yeah, so like with these ones, right? Yeah. 
Okay. So, yeah, we 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 uh, we've uh, we've spent some time on these, right? So, there there are kind of a couple ways to to think about these distributive forces. Okay. Um, and uh, one is to think about them in terms of okay, I got to get the units to work out. Okay. We got to have some way of getting the units to work out. Okay, so sometimes what we'll do, okay, is we'll say, okay, I somehow need to get to an internal force, uh, but I've been given like some type of distributed force, okay, and I need these units, so I'll just balance them out. Okay, that's one way to do it. Okay, the other is to say, all right, I need some internal force in order to be able to plug that into my integral of uh, uh, P over EA dx. Okay. So I need an internal force. Well, what is that internal force? That internal force is going to be the integration of that distributed force as I move along. Okay, as I move along that object, okay, actually speaking. So in this problem, all right, what what we said is all right, there's gravity acting. And if I am thinking, okay, my distributed force, again, this is kind of going back to the units idea. If I have a, a beam that has a cross section, okay, and I know that gravity has uh, units of meters per second squared, okay, and I know that the beam has density um, and I need to get somehow newtons per meters, then I can think of this distributed force, okay, as kind of newtons per meter, right? And what is it going to be? It ends up that it's going to be, well, rho times area, right? So I have kilograms per meters cubed times area. That gives me kilograms per meter, okay? Kilograms per meter times meters per second squared, right? that will give me kilograms per second squared, okay? And I'm just, right, and Newton's is kilograms, uh, meters per second squared, right? So I'm just off by my meters, which means I'm, per, I'm, I'm, I'm aligned with what I want for Newton's per meter, okay? But what, it, what it's really, this distributed force, right, is really saying that I have, uh, as I, as I move along, right? Like I know what a force is. I have a, a, an intuition for what a force is, right? But this distributed force or this distributed torque, right? Which is the same thing, newton meters per meter. That's saying that it's, it's somehow there's some type of uh, acceleration, some type of body force, right? That's acting on the system. And I need to know Okay, what the density of the object is and what the cross-sectional area of the object is okay, in order to be able to figure out what that distributed force is. Or just, yeah, right? That, that's pretty much what we're saying. Okay, did that help a little bit? Okay. So it's just like kind of intuitive? Huh? It's just kind of intuitive? Like it's, it's not the same every time? Or? So if you have gravity, okay, then and it's a normal loading, right? Then you're going to see something like rho GA. Okay, that's just what it's going to be. Now, in the centrifuge problem, right, that gravity is not constant as a function of position, right? So that's a very, that was a mean problem to put. Okay, I liked it because it's like, oh, this is a cool problem because I did my, I did some research on using centrifuges, right? So it's like, oh, you know, the gravity varies and it'll be fun. It was not very funny, all right? Um, but I did specify what the acceleration was in that problem, okay, if, if, we, if we look at it. But then, will you do a centrifugal load on, on this exam? No, okay, I'll, I'm not gonna tell you everything, but that, that's, that's off the table, all right? Okay. But a distributed force due to gravity, yeah, we could, you know, that's rho GA, all right? That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty common, okay? What you also see though, right, is that somehow you could have a distributed force being applied uh, 
by maybe like I said, like a trunk around, like for distributed torque, actually, right? It was a trunk wrapped around the bar or the rod. Okay, is that realistic? I don't know. But you could you could also think, okay, maybe I've got a rope wrapped around it, right? That's another interesting problem. We won't get into actually. It's uh, called a capstan problem. If you wrap rope around a certain number of times, it's amazing just the friction between the rope and the the, the rod. Uh, and a sufficient number of wraps, you can you can apply a lot of torque before it's going to slip. Okay, but that's a different. Actually, I think we did cover that when I cover mechanics uh, a long time ago. But we're not going to cover that here. But that's that's a anyway. So there are different situations where you could find a distributed different distributed force being applied. Okay. Um, another like another way to think of a distributed force is like if you were or uh, it would be more on a beam bending problem right but if you were uh, uh, hanging a bunch of objects along a beam okay and if those objects all had constant mass that would be kind of you could approximate that as a, as a distributed force right you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to say oh well maybe you would but you probably don't want to say oh i have this point load, this point load, this point load, this point, you know, if it's like you're, you're hanging an array of lights or something, okay, across, or that's maybe a bad example, but you're hanging a bunch of stuff across the beam, right? You could approximate that as a distributed force, okay? And um, even in this situation, you could say, well, I'm hanging a bunch, this situation, I'm hanging a load here, hanging a load here, hanging a load here, I'm hanging a bunch of weights on it, and then again, you could approximate that as a distributed <coughs> force. But gravity is often the one that we think of because, well, these objects have, have mass. And so if, you're, and if you have a cable right, and you make that cable really, 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 really long, you can also start to think of it as a distributed force. If you are trying to, so people have talked about, are you familiar with the space elevator, right? Well, you have, there are a couple things going on there, right? But, one is that the a rope would have to be able to kind of uh, support its its own weight, but it also has an object like an, a, a satellite essentially uh, hanging on on the outside, right? And uh, so it also has a, a tremendous amount of uh, tension in that in that system. So you have those two com kind of competing loads. Okay. Other questions. So go ahead, the session 11 and 12 are not due until um, Wednesday, but I'll be here for like, as you're going through, if you have questions on the previous problems on exams, on exam one, <coughs> you wanna look at those today, right? So it's pretty much a study session from here. I'll, I'll, and I'll be happy to go around and, and I'll talk to you all as you're going through.
So there's a there's a question, all right, about uh, one of the the previous homework problems for torsion. And, and this problem was was hard. Okay, this problem was 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 pretty hard. Okay, and it's it's from the fall twenty uh, twenty uh, semester, which was uh, also. I mean, this was a the reason why this this uh, exam is the way it is is because we were all virtual. I mean, in terms of the layout, so the exams were all on on Canvas. Okay, but. I just want to mention a couple of things. I won't go through all the details here, but this problem is definitely a statically indeterminate problem. Okay, so you have two options. One is to use geometric compatibility, all right, or the other is to use superposition. I chose to use superposition in this problem. Okay, and if you look at the answers, um, so what does that mean? That means you remove a load and then you apply the load, right, and then you make the displacement equal to zero. And that means that, that a torque that you're applying to this system, right, it's going, when I, when I think about the, the superposition, right, that torque is a, being applied throughout, right? So, you know, I come up with what the displacement is from this system when I remove, say, this end, or I remove this end, depending on how you want to look at it, right? And then I have a torque that I apply and it goes through the entire system, okay? But it's ignoring, right, it's ignoring Right? It's ignoring, this is the torque that I applied through the entire system, but it's ignoring this torque in the middle. Okay? But it still comes out with the, the final superposed response. But one thing that I think is important to remember is this idea of members being along for the ride. We've talked about this before in normal loading. Okay? This member, CD, okay, between C and D, if I'm just doing super, if I if I've removed say the bottom, okay. Well, actually, let's say I remove the top, okay. Let's say I remove the top. How much, without this constraint up here, how much is CD? What is the relative displacement between C and D with the top removed? Yeah, is that good? It's zero, 
okay? What is its actual displacement though relative to, let's say, B? What is the displacement of C or D with respect to B? Yeah, it's gonna be exact, exactly, great. It's gonna be whatever the, the angle of twist is in this region, okay? So CD is just along for the ride, okay? If this is, if this is removed. Now, let's go down to this AB. Again, we're imagining that D has been removed, this constraint at D. What is the internal torque that AB is experiencing if there's nothing happening here? What is the internal torque between A and B? Yes? Is it the resultant torque of the distributed load? Yes, exactly. Okay? So in this case, right, remember how we were just talking about you integrate the distributed, distributed force, the distributed load, times the distance? In math terms, what is it? It's the resultant torque, I agree, what is it? And what is it? It's an integral. What is it? Just it's, it's. Oh, torque times distance. Yeah. So it's going to be the torque that this member sees is just going to be it's the area absolute, right? It's integral T D, all right, and then it'll be applied over from the region B to C, all right. So it's this T D L two. Okay, and it's a constant torque in this member. So the angle of twist A B. Right? Again, we're assuming that this is removed. That is just going to be TDL2. The complicated one, right, is this one, <laughs> where you have the distributed torque. Right? But we know how we do that one. Okay? We did that. Right? And that's, that answer is going to be like um, the, the TDL2 uh, over the 2JG. Or, it's, uh, or actually, no, that's not right. It, I did it. I have to, I have to look make sure I get that one right. Okay. That one is going to be the T, sorry, T D L L2 squared over 2 J G. Okay. And that's that's doing that in a roll out appropriately. Okay. So that's how much angle twist you have in that middle section. All right. So sometimes you're like, oh I am or I'm like, oh I got a you know I've got this complicated problem and uh, I have to think about, all right, what is along for the ride? What is actually experiencing a distributed load? And what can I, you know, what is the actual load in a member? And if it's below where the distributed uh, torque ends, it's just the resultant torque that's being applied to that member, okay? Same thing applies for um, axle, okay? Another example where this came up, okay, very similarly, I pointed out, was in the last spring exam. Whoops, wrong one. The with this one, okay. If you go through it, what I was asking people to do is think about superposition, right? And thinking about, okay, what's, you know, what's along for the ride where, all right? Or what is the resultant torque that's being applied to the different parts of the system, okay? So if I remove T1, right, and I look, if I remove T1, then the torque in this AB region, if T1 is gone, and the torque in this BC region, they're the same. Even though they have different cross sections, that torque, that internal torque is the same. And that internal torque is gonna to be that T3 times this, make it a little bit bigger. It's gonna be this distributed torque that would have Newton meters per meter as units. That would be uh, this T3 times L3. Okay, and then that's going to be the torque that's in AB and in BC. But then I have to know what's happening in CD with that distributed torque being applied. But again, 
that one is going to be the T3L3 squared over 2JG. Okay, that's all I wanted to point out there. That it's it's uh, that we want to be able to keep track of the superposition, and this applies to axial loading and also to the, uh, or also to the, the torsional loading. Section eight, question three. Uh, it looks uh, like this. Mm -hmm. There's two bars. He wants to know. I think the question was the deformation at the center line. Right. 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 Yes. Uh, and I kind of tried to think this through, and I went through two like methods. Right. Because I had multiple methods written out. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if it makes sense, and I don't know if it makes sense to me. But so stress. You calculate the stress for each member, which lets you get the net stress by just uh, getting so the difference multiplied by the area. So I, I don't. So typically, we don't want to think in terms of net stress. Okay. You, it's only going to, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we can. There are going to be situations where when we do combined loading, we think of combined stresses and stuff. Yeah. But for this type of problem, um, and I guess it's kind of okay because the cross-sectional area is the same in both regions. Mm -hmm. So it's probably safer to think in terms of net forces. Okay. Okay. So I did find the total actual force sure. method. Sure. I don't know if that's a better way to do it. So, I mean, there's, uh, what's better? What's, yeah. What's, yeah. I just figured but because each one of these segments will, uh, it's a positive temperature, so they're going to increase. Uh -huh. So I figured increases this wall and the yeah. force, the greater force, you kind of think of like the net. So it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. So this, uh, yeah, and, and so if, like, so if I take a junction, if I look at the junction, I sum the forces there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you're going to have this ability to get this net force, okay? But um, the, uh, uh, there's no internal, but actually, a little bit misleading. It's going to be the same force in both of these members, okay, because there's no external, there was no force being applied. Yeah. Right? So uh, you're going to have the same force in, in both of them. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. What, I guess that makes sense. What, it's just mm -hmm. what, what I'm, member. That's right. Distributed. Kind of. That's right. So what, what, um, what I'm, what, what I'm, just highly suggest mm -hmm. you have is choose whether or not you're going to do geometric compatibility or you're going to do superposition. Okay. Right? So right now I don't see expressions for geometric compatibility. This is what we would call, these are called constituent equations, right? Yeah. Say that's yeah, the displacement. Yeah, like, yeah. That's the displacement, right? Due to a force, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. Right? So once we know a force, then yes, we can figure out what the displacement is, but we need to have some uh, geometric compatibility, all right, if we're going to do a geometric compatibility, or we need to have, and even if we do a superposition, we need to have some geometric compatibility. Okay. So, so if we're going to think about geometric compatibility, all right, then we can think of, all right, what is the displacement in this region, right, so if we call that like delta one, right, yeah. and we call, it, and let's say what is the displacement of this region, we call it delta two. Right? That has to be equal to the displacement between those two. Uh, right? And which is zero. Yeah. Right? So now we've got delta one plus delta two is equal to zero. That's a very key equation that then allows us to use the constituent equations, mm -hmm. all right, to go about solving the problem. I think that makes sense. Okay, so if you look at the notes, if you pull up the notes for this one, this is not it, right? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a which is a
actually had less algebra. So here's what I was talking about, delta one. That's the delta two. That's right. So right. And this is equal to the overall delta. It's nice to equal to zero. It's a close cover. Right? Yeah. And then, right, we can think of each of those individual deltas, right? What is the delta? It, well, it's going to be some uh, delta one alpha t l one, right? That's from the thermal expansion. Yeah. Opposing it is also so we said the force is going to be the same in both of those methods, right? So then we have the minus f over k1. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Because the force is the same. And then we add them together, and that has like three. Okay. Um, so, Yeah, I mean, there's a, another way to think about it. Uh, well, there's two position vectors to get it first. Um, right? And so the way this one works is I say, okay, it's unconstrained that right side. And then let's take a look at what you have with delta 1 and delta 2. Okay. And then we have to think about, oh, well, whatever that delta is, total delta is, and the delta 1 plus delta 2, I have to apply some force through those two members okay, to, get it, to get it back to zero. Okay. Right. And that I can think of these, I think of these as springs that have a series of each other. Okay. And but they have the same force. So again, they have the same force. Okay. So this is just the typical Dalton equation. There's no k is unbounded. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But so that was the only thing I, I think it's missing is I just don't see any of the other compatibility. Yeah. Right. Okay. Like you're making some you're making pretty good I think that you're making some good you're writing down equations that are all true. Yeah. But we need to get the compatibility and the other understanding of So this is another exam question, actually. So if you go, the, the thing I was doing was like, uh, I would go up here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we already got it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about let's talk about your system. Is that okay? Let's give the whole class. All right. All right. Okay. So, uh, your attention again, I know I'm interrupting your thoughts, but just, just your attention again. Um, there, there, uh, last spring, I didn't ask a question on this, but um, it, is, it is fair game, okay? But it is, and it is complicated. When it looks, when we look at what's happening for geared systems, all right? Okay, where is what I want? I had a good, yeah. Uh, this is not, there. Okay, here's a geared system, all right? So there are really, these are confusing, okay? They confuse me, I think they confuse well, I don't know. They confuse a lot of people, all right? They confuse me, all right? There are essentially two big things that you want to keep in mind when you have two gears mating with each other, okay? One is how their angular displacements relate to each other, okay? And one way to think about this is to put a gear, like a small gear, 
just on a flat surface and roll it. So it's like a make it think of it as a wheel, right? And you know that the distance that it will roll is going to be equal to r theta. Okay? Because we're thinking in, when theta is in radians, of course, right? When theta is in radians, this is r theta. So it rolls that amount. If I take another gear, it has a different diameter, right? Then the amount it rolls is r2 theta, or r whatever that new r is, okay? So when you have gears that are mating with each other, it's very important to realize that their geometric compatibility all right, is based on the distance that these things would roll if they were just put on a table. Okay, so that we have R1 theta 1 and R2 theta 2, right? So that their linear, dis even though they're they're rotating, their linear displacements are what are equal to each other. So that's the first thing. The second important thing to relate and keep in mind is that it's not equilibrium of torques, okay, between the mating gears, but it's equilibrium of forces where the teeth meet, okay? So, the, what does that mean? That means that you have, let's say you have a tooth here acting on gear one, okay? And there's some torque from that force, one, all right? That torque is given by uh, R1, F1, okay? So that, you know, if I make the gear bigger, right, then the torque is gonna be larger, right? If I increase the, the force, then the torque is larger, okay? So the effective torque, right, that this member sees is going to be given by the radius times F1. And as Kayla pointed out, make sure you use radius and not diameter, okay? Now, that F1, is going to be equal to equal and opposite to a force acting on the other gear, F2. Okay, so these are the equivalents. Just like we talked about geometric compatibility and we had equivalent displacements, it's not equivalent torques, but it's equivalent forces between the gears. And so when we when we look at that, what we get is F1 is equal to F2. And in this case, all right. What we have is we have an external torque being applied to the system, and we also have this T2, right, from this member here, okay? And we have this force acting. So we still do, we equilibrium of torque still applies, still applies to this body, which is the gear, okay? But between the gears, we look at balance of forces, okay? So that's just the point I want to make. If we do those two things, if we keep that in mind, then the rest of the, the problem is at least somewhat tractable, okay? But if you don't have that information, right, if you don't know what the geometric compatibility is, or we forget that it's equilibrium of forces between these two mating gears, then it can lead to uh, going into to, uh, incorrect directions. All right, I just want to point that out. Okay, now I'll come over. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Thank you. Remind me of something, something I just emphasize. Uh, okay, so yes, so now if we go into this, uh, and we can look at the, uh, this problem, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the similar kind of deal, right? Yeah. What we're looking at is, okay, we have to figure out what that, what the balance of the force is. It's from the mass, right, exactly, right. So that's the mass that's the <coughs> torque that, that your V is experiencing. Yeah. The, the torque that your C is experiencing, right, well, you tell me, what would that be? What is it, um, uh, just the, the torque uh, in CV, what is that going to be equal to? That's 
going to be through the, you bring a ratio from this as to like the larger to the smaller to the bigger. Like I know you can draw it. How old is it for high for degrees? I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't know that. Well, the current MCV, that's going to be equal to M1G times A1, uh, right? Because that's the, that's the torque that M1 is applying, right? So both of these numbers, right, the AB member and the CD member. Again, we're using like the cover up method, yeah. right? So if I just cover up everything that's happening on the right, I can see what's happening in, in A, B, right? Yeah. If I cover up everything that's happening on the left, I can see the torque that's internal to C, D. Simply, just the masses times their times gravity times the length of those masses. Yeah. Okay. But then, yes, what's complicated is what happens at the interface, yeah. right? Um, and so for that, so so now we have. Uh, and if you look at each of these, you know, you take one of these years, right? We have this, this, this torque, right, being applied from the number of VA, and we have also um, a torque that's because of the force, right? And because of this interaction that is between them. So, like, if we look at equilibrium here, we have a minus VA, right? So that's the VA that's the mass. We treat each of these gears as a member on which torques are acting, and we look at the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And then you treat them as like almost like a frozen wall, it's just static. It's in the problem saying it's static. So it's sort of yeah, well, we want everything to be. Uh, well, not static, but like, I mean, like connected to the wall. It's, not it's not connected to the wall. Everything is. This is a new, it's kind of a new problem because everything's balanced out just perfectly. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so that. It's like we're picking an M1 and an M2 in all these dimensions, but it's just perfectly balanced. Okay. Right. Also, the other thing we watch is this video. Where do you actually do this? Trying to say let's work on this side instead of that. Well, uh, saying, yeah, yeah. They 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 have we have to go through the transmission. Okay, right. Yeah. And then, I mean that's another way to think of these gear systems, right? Is that this is a, is a transmission, right? So if right, we have um, uh, if we go from a big to a small gear, right? That is going to mean that your the amount of torque that you So the linear displacement that they travel, those are the same. So R1 theta 1 and R2 theta 2, those are the same. Right? That's what we're getting at here in this problem. That we have geometry compatibility with R1 theta 1 over R1 phi 1 and R2 phi 2. Okay? And we have, um, so that, and then we have equilibrium of the forces at the gears, at the T. So those are that's what's lining up. So, but then you get then you get different torques. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. It's not so weird. So I think this is the Okay. So let's first. Um, 
Well, where's the missing diagrams on your work?
So what, and then we're going to put in not displacement, which we want quite a displacement. Oh, and it's just a
Displacement of R. Displacement of G. Okay, so for this one. <coughs> so this is the little bit of a 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 little Displacement between C and D at this point. Um, no, right? <coughs> so this L3 length does not have all of it. Is okay, so that's the one path. Right? Um, oh, I didn't Is your relative displacement between C and D? That already could be put in the color. Absolutely, right? So that one you're going to find from this equation. But that's not between C and D. C and D, so that would be C right? So that would be C and D, so you would have 2D times L2 squared A is like 2. That's fine, but that's not an angle, it's 200 times. Right, so sometimes we use phi, a lot of times we use phi, like we use GL over J2, right? Or we use, you know, you could find yourself using theta as well, but for this task, we use C. So then the question now is, what yes. is so we said this relative displacement is zero. I know there's some phi C of E in here. So one way to look at this is, what is delta 1 really equal to? I guess people would say that delta 1 would be equal to delta phi. I mean, so I mean, this is delta, but really we should just define 1 is equal to phi D relative to C plus phi C relative to D plus five. So, all right, so this one is zero. This one you're going to come over here. So now, what is this one? What is five D A two point seven? No, there's a torque being applied above it, right? The distributed torque. What is the total torque from this? Uh, what's the total torque being applied to phi dA? So let's ask ourselves, what is dA is equal to what? Sure, it's equal to dA, but that doesn't help us much. Right? That's, that's correct. What is it in terms of applied external force or external torque? 
in that older day and it's going to be a flower yeah. again. So, okay, so and this is tradition of it's going to be constant. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 so five years of switching to D, but this is two millimeters per meter. If we did it in millimeters, so it's TD times L2. Because what is it? So it's really the interval. This is where we're talking about the distributed force question, right? This is the TD times the DX assumption, right? And in this case, you can think of it as 25. So this is the force. It's the DC, essentially. It's going from B to C. This is a little bit confused because here. So this is, so it's just the FAB TD L2. So this one is like, this one is the, this is that format TL over J. Right? It's TDL2 times L1 over J. Yeah. That would give you, no. So we'll get it 5CB plus 5VA will give us this. So now you got five one, right? So now I've got to figure out delta two or five two. So yes, so do we, what are we going to have? Delta two is going to be equal to. So it's so there are a couple ways to think of this, right? One way to think of this. So if this is all the same material and has the same cross section area, so we're changing the constant throughout the whole thing, I think they are, right? Then, okay, that makes slides a little bit easier. So first, so we can say that this is every single C constraint, right? This is TL over JG. So this one is, like you're saying, L1 plus L2 plus L3 over JG. Okay. Wait, no, it's, 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 it's division then by the end. Right, because if, if they're all the same, if they're not all the same, I don't know if they're all the same or not. So that actually two. It would not be four. So the normal stress is over G. Now you're ready to stress. That's what we're going to do if it's constrained. Yeah. 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 So we can say, yeah. so yeah. so yeah. 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 or just a total amount of stress. I can do it. What kind of material has a few modules in it? So that's, that's good. No, it'll be like a right. So then that means that this is here. Wait. You see that? Because these are like the bottom of the box. Yeah, the series of each other. So from here, we probably have one more. Yeah, we can do that. So what we're going to have, yeah, so we're going to have, now we're going to have, exactly. So we're going to have this. We're going to have this expression of the 5 1. Oh, wait. So phi one is going to be equal to phi two, right? And everything. What's the only unknown? The only unknown is that. metal right and I 
heat it up, right? And then the one M is three, right? Then there's going to be some mass weight associated, right? But yeah, that's one of the interesting things about thermal strain. And so often I write thermal strain and stress is because there's no stress in an object that is thermally expanding or thermally contracting if it's not constrained. But if it is constrained, then there's a force So if the F bar is constrained at both ends, and then there's applied load. So what kind of applied load? Force. Uh, force. force. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then there's also a change in temperature. Yeah. Would you, if you found a stress by using strain and temperature uh, times, and you found no stress using total air, would you just add them together using coolness? Or no, no, no. So it's, it's not quite, I mean, so we were talking about this earlier. Stresses, we try not to avoid, we try to avoid adding stresses to each other unless it's the same process. Right? Because the thing you want is some equilibrium forces. Okay? Yeah, so when we do combine both things, we will add stresses directly. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, so in the case you just described, it's a, it's a big superposition problem. Okay? So the way I would break it down, if I have a thermal, Load and I have a, a force based load in a problem like this. I would probably try to look at what's happening thermally and then having that equivalent force, right, from the reaction, from the reaction right, on the system. And that's my, then I'll say that's my thermal stress. And then I would go about looking at, okay, I have some applied force to the system as well. And that, I would say, that's going to be my force based. I guess so in that case, yeah, that's a case where you would be adding the stresses to, to each other. Okay, it's the same process. Okay. Yeah. Or or you're looking at this is the equivalent force, this is your equivalent force, and then that. So yeah, okay. I'll take it. I'll take my word back. Yeah. But that problem is that a problem from the uh, from the uh, previous yes. example? Yeah. Well this well, one's not, not this one's not easy. This one's not that. Yeah, I was just this wondering one's not that. I was just wondering. Yeah, this one's, but there's another one that is pretty bad. Which one? Is this one? Uh, I think it was, was it 16 or 2015? 16, I think. Let me see. And I go up, please. Uh, I guess, oh, that's 2016. Let's do 2015. Not that I'm evil. Just look at these ones. Yeah, so this one, I don't know, that one? No, the one above the whole That one's pretty simple. Okay, but there I didn't, that's just a thermal. It's still just a thermal problem, okay? But then it gets complicated with some of these details.
Yes, Tyler. Everybody, it's time to say goodbye.